Well, after a little bit of rain here in Iowa and a little bit of a return to fall weather, the question now is, what does the rest of the season hold? Meteorologist Kyle Mara, better known as Kai the Cloud Guy, joins us now. Kai, uh, you, you've covered Midwestern weather for some 20 years now uh, and seen just about everything, whether it's a, you know a heat wave in the middle of October or snow, uh, tornadoes in December as well. Um, what kind of sticks out at what you're watching for this winter ahead? Well, you know, from a severe weather standpoint, I kind of have a bit of a concern for the Southeast US at this point, uh, because they can get severe weather year round down there. You're talking places like Arizona, Tennessee, Georgia, Alabama areas, Mississippi areas. And one of the key reasons for that is not only has it been a pretty warm year in general, but there were no hurricanes that came into the Gulf this year at least as of our conversation right now. And so as a result, you've got a huge pool of undisturbed water down there that's a little bit on the warm side, as you might imagine. And so any storm systems that can hit that Gulf Gulf air and Gulf moisture can pull that right up in there. And then that's kind of the capital of nighttime tornadoes down in that part of the country. So if you get that kind of humidity with any sort of low pressure system, I would say that that could be probably the spot that we need to watch going forward in the next couple months. And that's kind of become the new tornado alley. I mean, you, you mentioned the nocturnal threat, but but really we've seen a lot yeah. of that shift, especially late in the season from the traditional tornado alley to uh, kind of along the Gulf Coast and points north. Well, I remember when I first started in broadcasting, we just didn't really have a whole lot of severe weather going on, at least in the upper Midwest in that November, December time frame. There's a big outbreak in 2005. I do remember that one. I was a uh, student at Iowa State University, and you can see on the tornado zones map here, um, this comes to us from Climate Central, but there is a, a definitive increase in tornado days since 1979. It's not like it's a huge increase because when you look at a long-term record, it doesn't tend to change quickly one way or the other, but we're definitely seeing things light up from Southeast Missouri, Arkansas, and then especially Tennessee and Kentucky. And one thing that sticks out to me with these Southeast US outbreaks is the Mayfield, Kentucky tornado. That thing was just a beast. And it came during a time of year that you don't really look for that kind of stuff. So um, I think that's something that we, we need to look at. And the data certainly spells that out, that the Southeast US is kind of where it's at, not just in the in the fall, but also kind of in the springtime too, because you know how many Aprils have we been freezing up here in the Midwest while well, they've got huge squall lines ripping down through Arkansas and Tennessee. So uh, there's any number of reasons to believe that we're either getting an expansion of tornadic activity, maybe not a huge net change for Oklahoma or Kansas, but if nothing else, just an expansion east, southeast from there. You know, getting back into maybe some more traditional weather here in terms of temperatures, this is normally when we see that shift from the summertime heat to the wintertime cold. It seems to be a little bit delayed here in the Midwest. I mean, I, I recall running the air at the beginning of this month. So I, I guess so far, how yeah. does this coming fall and winter look like compared to some we've seen in the past? Well, you know, the rest of October is probably going to keep rolling on the warm side, especially here in the Midwest states. Um, right now, at least at Cedar Rapids, Iowa, that's the only data point I looked at, but at least at Cedar Rapids, Iowa, we have a chance, it's not a great chance, but a chance to match October of 1963, which is the warmest on record when it comes to average temperature. And the first half of October, minus that rain day yesterday, has basically just been a swath of 70s and 80s all across the area. So, you know, when you look at something like that, you think, all right, well, what does 1963's winter look like? Well, there's the graphic. Normal temperatures in the Midwest and then well below as you go all the way down to the southern U.S. and into Florida. Now, that would generally just be probably a one-off situation. But a lot of times we want to connect A and B, right? So the next logical question is, well, if October is such a blowtorch like it was back in 1963, what does the winter provide in 63, 64? The thing about that is that's just one sample size. That's just one year. But clearly, meteorological winter, which we'll define as December to February, it clearly got cold. And even an average winter in the Midwest is actually fairly chilly when you think about it. So to have that kind of cold air getting down, you know, to Texas, well below average temps into Alabama, Mississippi for you know, eventually meteorological winter, it's definitely something we'll want to watch for, I think, going forward. Yeah, and a lot difficult, more difficult for them to handle it simply because their infrastructure isn't designed right. to, to cope with it. Right. Uh, yeah. I wonder, too, uh, 
you know, we've seen obviously a large scale pattern change over the decades where regardless of the month, things uh, broad scale have been getting warmer and warmer. It, it, has there been any shift in that or can we continue to expect to see that? Because obviously we're seeing more record heat months, uh, more record yeah. hot years, uh, and it doesn't seem like anything's kind of showing that that trend is easing off at all. No, not really. Uh, you know, in the Midwest, because of what we do here in terms of corn and agriculture, a lot of our warming here actually comes at night versus what we have during the day. A lot of our scorching daytime highs, we'll never see those again unless we decide to plant totally different crops up here. But you'll notice that the, the strongest amounts of warming are happening in rather arid areas, such as the Western United States, Desert Southwest. There's a little bit going on in northern sections of Minnesota as well. But then if you pick on Iowa, you only see about a degree right there and then actually closer to zero when you head down towards the southeast U.S., Reason for that, high humidity tends to regulate the temperature. And that's why, you know, you don't see freezing temperatures down in Miami, Florida, because you've got so much moisture to kind of regulate that boundary layer a little bit. But when it comes right down to it, uh, the Octobers going into these La Nina years, which is where the Climate Prediction Center is pointing us right now. There's a stout La Nina that has developed and there's virtually 100% chance of La Nina taking over, at least for this winter. If you look at this graphic here, if you take a weak La Nina, which what I wound up doing is comparing this, a weak La Nina that was in place 1989, 1996. Nick, up by your hometown, February of 96 was a doozy. 2008, <laughs> 2013, 2017, and 2024. Now, really, there's one of those years that sticks out that didn't do much, and that was last year at 2024, because you've been kind of hanging out in this neutral to slightly negative phase in the eastern eastern Pacific waters, which is where we're judging La Nina or El Nino. But if you average all that, you get a pretty warm October, typically. And so it's not out of the realm then that you're going to start to see things go equal and opposite. And one analogy I like to use that seems to resonate well with a lot of folks is if you're holding up that bench press bar, and you're going and you're going and you're going eventually in that ninth or tenth rep you're starting to get tired and eventually that weight's got to drop somewhere so it's not like the arctic doesn't exist it's there <laughs> and the air mass is intensely cold it's just how long is it having to charge up and when does that bench bar come down on us so to speak so well um, let's let's know, talk in about the analog that. years it's, it's meteorological winter yeah, let's let's discuss that, because obviously we're, we're, once we get into the winter months, we've seen some brutal, brutal cold between kind of that mm -hmm. Christmas to post New Year's period here in the upper Midwest uh, with that La Nina setup. And uh, I'll go ahead and put that graphic up first for you. I, I'm curious what you think uh, that the overall impact as we move into those later months and early months of next year, the, the impacts that we're going to see, because judging by the uh, the map that you sent me, it looks like we're kind of in a bit of a battleground between where the areas of colder and wetter conditions are expected to be. We are. And the biggest thing about this map that everybody is seeing right now, this is the average. This is the mean position of where the essentially variable polar jet stream is. And the key word there is variable. If you get a really, really deep low pressure system to drop through in an Arctic high, that jet will go all the way down to northern Mexico, southern Texas. But then there's going to be an oscillation. It's going to go back and forth, back and forth, and just kind of average out where it's at. Uh, this is the general trend, though. We do tend to get a little bit colder in the upper Midwest and the desert Southwest and places like Florida and the extreme South tend to trend a little bit drier in the heart of the winter months. So if this is the year that you've got a conference in Dallas or a conference down in Miami in January, maybe this is the year that you go down there and it's not in the forties and fifties, maybe it's in the sixties and seventies. Uh, so we'll, we'll have to see about that. But this was the big thing for me. So the map we just saw was a large scale map of what? A little bit colder in the Midwest, drier, a little warmer as you head down to the Southwest and Southeast. This is how the analog plays out. So if you look at the winter of 1989 and 90, and then you combine it with 96, 97, 08, 09, so on and so forth, this is how it averages out in terms of temperature, which is almost exactly what the jet stream diagram is and what analog forecasting is. You know, one of the, one of the phrases that drives me crazy, 
is when they say that weather is unpredictable. There's actually a lot more <laughs> obvious reasons. There's actually a lot more about weather that we can predict that you don't really think about every day. It's the reason why in Iowa, we don't do outdoor weddings on January 3rd or 4th. It's the reason why we know it's kind of risky to try and plan ahead for St. Patrick's Day in terms of what wardrobe we're going to wear. We know it's going to be variable. We can calculate sunrise and sunset years and years in advance. And so we know there's a set amount of daylight. We know there's a set amount of temperature range that we're operating in. But when does the extreme happen? That's something that's very difficult to tell unless you're about a week away. But uh, the way that this winter is looking, if it's anything like those analogs, we will probably have some pretty healthy Arctic shots followed up maybe by a week where it's in the 20s and 30s. Followed up by maybe another week where we're down around 20, 25 below for a couple of nights, you know. And of course, Nick, as you know, because you've worked in the business as well, if we have cold air without snow cover, it's not nearly as bad. If you lay down even an inch or two of snow and then you drop below zero, it's a whole nother ball game to recover from that. So snow cover is going to be key, which lately it's been really tough to get snow through Christmas time. But then after it, to your point, we just said, after Christmas in January, right after winter break, man, it just starts turning. So um, this might be the year where, where that could happen again. But it wouldn't surprise me if we start getting Arctic shots maybe as early as Halloween here. So it might be something to think about if you're costume planning already. Absolutely. One question, and I'm going to leave the politics out of this, but obviously with some of the changes in the weather service and NOAA, there's been some struggles in terms of the forecast modeling. Um, especially on the shorter and, and medium term on the models. Uh, how concerning is that heading into winter? Because obviously it's a little easier. I, I personally thought it was a lot easier to forecast thunderstorms, which are pretty powerful storms, as opposed to a winter system where a little bit of drizzle could be the difference between one to six inches, depending on that mixing ratio. Right. I think what the biggest thing we'll have to watch for, and keep in mind, you know, I've never I've never gotten paid a penny for working in the government, so I don't know what their day to day is like. But I do know this. I do know they're short staffed and I do know that short staff turns into burnout. That's what I do know for sure. And when we get into the winter months, I don't know if we're going to have necessarily a technology issue. Uh, it might just be more of can the messaging be nice and clear and largely the broadcast community can take care of that. But what a lot of people don't realize is that NOAA and the National Weather Service, they issue the, what's called the decision support packet. And that will go to uh, district officials for schools, such as superintendents, that'll go to city planners, that'll go to departments of transportation. And that all happens behind the scenes. We as the public don't notice that. And those decision support packets can sometimes be 10 to 15 pages long in a given thunderstorm. And all of a sudden, if you're a lead forecaster all night, you've got to write the discussion. You've also got to do a conference call with the districts in your area, and you got to get that packet out. Now you've got a fatigued person who might have to do the midnight shift the next day when the storm finally starts snowing. So I could see us getting kind of tired in that regard. But you know, if a radar happens to go down, during a winter event, it might not be, you know, the end of the world, like a life-threatening situation when it comes to, you know, tornadic activity or severe thunderstorm activity. But the biggest thing about snow is the transportation industry. So, you know, we do have to keep that in mind that even a small glaze can just be trouble as can be for transportation and trucking and things like that. So um, the lack of upper air data, and it's not really the lack anymore. It, it seems like instead of launching at 6 a.m., out in Omaha, it seems like they're launching now at noon and one o'clock. So we still get a midday observation, but it doesn't really help you too much when you're trying to plan for the day with the school districts in your area, if you're gonna have freezing rain versus sleet versus snow. And as we know, growing up in Iowa, if you have a two inch snow event, you can go to school in that. If it transitions over to freezing rain, you're effectively done. And sometimes that can happen during the trip to school. And so there might be some hiccups in that regard, but I, I'm really hopeful that even with the cuts in place, the technology should be able to keep us going through. But I do have concern for our NOAA personnel and just making sure they're healthy going through the winter time. Yeah, absolutely. It's It's been uh, difficult to watch that when you know so many people that are, oh, yeah. they're, they're committed to the cause and they're gonna, they're gonna do everything within their power to, to keep this going mm -hmm. as, as best as possible. And yeah, you bring up a good point. Obviously not just 
the, uh, the, the light precipitation nature of, of winter accumulation, but also that precipitation type that is always really hard to find those, those cutoff areas between the rain, freezing rain, snow, et cetera. Right. And the National Weather Service offices have the same challenge that the local media offices do, too, because they've got what they call counting county warning areas uh, in their weather forecast office domain. It's usually, you know, 25, 30 counties, whatever the count happens to be. Much like a TV viewing area, you have counties that are going to be getting different types of precipitation. You've got an advisory maybe for half the area. You've got a warning for the other half. Maybe there's a strip of counties where nothing's going on. And then the great part is now you've got to figure out, you know, if, if you're trying to help somebody in a semi truck drive from St. Louis to St. Paul, who's got to go through a winter storm, that's going to be difficult. Um, there were several times when I get on the phone with local colleges and try and help plan out bowl trips for college football teams and yeah. trying to fly out of the Eastern Iowa airport and get to their destination safely ahead of a blizzard and things like that. So, uh, precipitation type is a headache and it's it's always going to be a headache i just i really hope that we're in a position now where where the cuts didn't really put us at risk i hope going into the winter time but we got to get through it and see and if there are some misforecasts if there are things that are not going the way they should be or maybe there's some maintenance problems then yeah that might fall on the shoulders of the cuts that we had earlier this year well i appreciate you giving us the time real quick before we go a plug away. Tell, tell us what you're working on. I know you've got a, your, a podcast to your own. Yeah. Yeah. So myself and former meteorologist at KCRG TV nine, Jan Ryherd, we've teamed up to actually do a podcast of our own. We launched it in, back in June and we kind of built it off of a very simple model where Jan just asked me one day, Hey, do you think we can just do something where people just ask questions and we answer them? Kind of like what you and I are doing right now. Right, and yeah. it's an entire episode. And we literally called it weathered questions because a lot of the questions we get are ones that we have heard for years and years and years, hence weathered. Like we've been out in the elements forever and they kind of wearing down on us a little bit, but that it has spurred some awesome conversation and actually questions that we have not even thought of in our career before. Um, one person actually asked, what, what is the matter of lightning? And I had to go in and research some stuff here and really kind of get to the bottom of it. But what we're what we're all about is just simple stuff, simple question answers. So you, you throw the podcast on on the way to work or somewhere else. And it, you're, it's not designed to hurt your brain. It's designed to just right. learn a little bit about weather. And then um, on the website, I've got some fun educational videos. And the entire website is dedicated to K through 12 education. And it's free for any school in the United States to uh, to have and, and learn from. Because um, at, at one point, I realized that uh, my daughters had not gone through a weather unit in over a year. And I thought to myself, gosh, that doesn't seem right. Like, we need to make sure we understand this stuff. And it's nothing crazy. It's what's a cold front? What's a warm front? Because you know what's going to happen when they get out of school, no matter what their profession is, weather's all around them. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it changes how you dress for the day. I mean, every single day, the girls wake up and they're like, Dad, what's the high? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I know you got to dress for the day. And you can tell on the way to the bus stop, which families paid attention and which didn't. That's well, the it, cool part. It, it's good that you're you're basically following where, where the tweeners are, because, you know, when we were growing uh -huh. up, our weather education <laughs> yeah. came from watching the news and you know exactly. that's just not that's not where people are going anymore so you got to go where the people are kyle right. mara and the last thing i need to do is like a push notification or something and say hey kids yeah. get your get your coats on today it's might be 60 now but it's going to be 25 when you get off the bus <laughs> got to figure that software out <laughs> absolutely meteorologist kyle mara thanks for joining us and hopefully we will have a uh, happy and safe winter all right thank you